Welcome to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution of the United States. The Executive Director of the Virtual Center is Dr. Bill O'Brien. He's also your host for this program. And here he is, Dr. Bill O'Brien. Good afternoon. This is Bill O'Brien, and today it is midweek. It is the 19th day of June, and uh, we welcome you to today's program. Uh, I can honestly, I mean, I usually start with the weather forecast because it kind of gets you into the program a little bit, but um, we've got a little bit of sun here in southern West Virginia today, and it's been a while. We need to dry out. Uh, we had uh, night before last here uh, in the Beckley area, we had one of those cells that just uh, moved into our area and suddenly decided it liked it here. And so we got like three and a half inches of rain in a couple of hours, and um, Everything is just soaked. So the fact that we're getting a little bit of sunshine today and we're expecting a little bit more tomorrow and a little bit more than that on on uh, uh, on Friday and Saturday, uh, something to look forward to. But I guess uh, that's that's really what it's all about, is always look forward. Uh, be the idealist of 1776, not the pessimist of 1787, maybe. Maybe that's the, the way to look at it. I appreciate your your time, your willingness to give us uh, a piece of your valuable time uh, on this Wednesday afternoon. I, I just hope uh, that we can make that co that commitment on your part worth your while. And I, all I can do is commit to you that I will do the best that I can to make that happen. Uh, we, would, we would very, very much like to hear from you uh, during our program. Uh, as I always do, I'm going to begin by giving you our phone number and invite you to pick up the phone and give us a call and let's chat for a while about the subject that we happen to be talking about, about perhaps a subject we dealt with yesterday, or something that you feel like we might uh, get into that would, that would be beneficial to, to other folks. Uh, the phone number uh, to get on the air uh, with us directly is area code 304-658-3333. That's 304-658-3333. My email address, and in fact, I'm going to open with a, with a very nice email that I got uh, uh, yesterday, last evening. Um, the email address, my personal email address, is waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's W A O'Brien I E N nine oh six at gmail dot com. I wanted to touch base a little bit, uh, uh kind of as a review for uh a couple of the issues that we dealt with yesterday. Uh, because we tended to, to shift gears in, in midstream, so to speak, and ended up dealing with two or three different topics during the course of our two hours together. Um, and and, and you know, in a sense, there's something very positive uh, about that. Uh, because the assumption is, if you know, you know, th those places where you live, to say, if you don't like the weather, just wait a minute. I used to hear that all the time when I when I was younger in, in New England. But the fact of the matter is, uh, one of the things I've learned over the years is, depending on the environment, the, the situation you're teaching in, if you're teaching a 50-minute class, then it barely it barely gives you time to say hello. But if you're teaching in a class that runs an hour and 15 minutes, or more frequently, a class that extends two and a half hours or so, then to pick, pick a topic and go on on the same topic for two and a half hours can be deadly. Uh, all the psychologists tell us that human, the, the human ability to focus attention on a, on a subject for that long is just not there. And when you combine that in a in an academic in a school situation with the fact you're dealing with kids who don't even want to be there anyway, in most cases, then um, the thinking is that if you can hold attention for 15 to 20 minutes, you're doing a really good job. And so the assumption is that what you have to do then is shift gears and and uh, give people an opportunity to stand up and stretch and uh, take a couple of deep breaths or whatever, and then theoretically get into a somewhat different topic, which would c cause students to reshift and give you another 15 to 20 minutes of, of focused attention. That's the theory, anyway. And so yesterday, we kind of did that, because we, we dealt with uh, 
in the first part of the program, we dealt with the whole issue of leadership again. We looked at, at some quotations on leadership. We began with Jefferson, but we contrasted uh, Jefferson with a quote from Chairman Mao on the whole issue of leadership and pointed out the very clear similarities between the two. And where we ended up going from that, and I, and I have to say, you know, these are not... Uh, and, and I think this is the beauty of dealing with the primary source materials. Maybe I'm, I'm creating my own topic here, which I didn't intend to do. But I, I'm a big, as you know, I'm a big advocate of primary sources. I, I really think that in our, in our schools, that's really the missing element. That's the way to uh, essentially restore uh, attention on the part of students to, to the importance of, of education. But I, I won't go there right now. But what, what I... Um, uh, where we went yesterday, uh, unplanned, but the, the very nature of the material itself seems to take you in a direction, and that's what I love uh, about working with primary sources. Um, I sit down to write. I have no idea. I know where I'm going to start, and I know what I'm going to be writing about. But being able to sit down and envision ahead of time what I'm going to say and how I'm going to say it and where I'm going to end and where this is going to take, I have no idea. And what I find is that once I begin to write and once I begin to really focus on the issues at hand, the material itself seems to take me to places that I really hadn't even thought about going in the first place. And I, I find that very exciting. It's almost like uh, waking up in a, different, in a different country each day, if you, if you will, if, if you know what I mean. So anyway, the point of the story is that yesterday we were talk we were comparing two quotations on leadership, one by Thomas Jefferson, one by Chairman Mao. And the point was that they basically seemed to say pretty much about the same thing. But where the whole thing changes is when you put Thomas Jefferson's name on one and you put Mao Tse Tung's name on the other one. Because one of the things that occurred to me during the course of the program yesterday, as we were going through this, was that we tend to be programmed to respond to particular cues. And more often than not, that means knowing who made the statement as a way to determine whether the statement is worthy of your time and effort to think through and reflect upon. Think about that. I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty serious stuff, if you think about it. That, that our whole education system of responding to particular cues or particular signals tends to believe, oh, if Mao said it, then it's not even worth it. It's probably some communist propaganda stuff that isn't even worth reading, and you write it off. But if Jefferson said it, author of the Declaration of Independence, founding father, one of our, one of our founding heroes, etc., 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 then it's really well worth thinking through what and listening to what Thomas Jefferson might say about leadership, because he's probably somebody that really knows. And that perspective causes you to read Jefferson very carefully but probably not read Mao at all, and therefore miss the fact that both, both people are a, saying essentially the same thing. But because of the accoutrements associated with Mao's name and the fact that it's communist and all the rest of it, we tend not to take it very seriously. And one of the concerns I had, of course, is our education system encourages us to do just that because it's efficient. It's an efficient way of covering a lot of material in a shorter period of time, is knowing ahead of time what you can give light attention to and what you have to give serious attention to. And if the person who wrote it or said it is the issue, then it seems to me that's, that's pretty important to know. And if indeed there's something substantive about that particular conclusion, if that really is what our education system in many cases does, for us or to us, depending on how, how you look at it, then I think it's a very, very important issue to focus on and to, to be aware of. 
because again we are responding to cues we are we are not responding to substance and the issue that i raised yesterday and i really would like to reiterate it again today because i think it's very important is if your education from the very beginning has focused to a large degree on looking for cues and signs and hints and all the rest of it. In other words, finding efficient ways to cover large amounts of material in a short period of time. If that's really what our education system is all about, then what that means is, by definition, we do not develop the particular skills of critical reading and analysis that would be necessary to really understand the substance of what we're reading or not reading. Because the fact of the matter is, if Mao's name on a statement is reason enough to not seriously consider the statement, then the alternative is probably true. And that is that Jefferson's name on a statement is probably reason to read very carefully what he said. In fact, it could be that there's not nearly as much value or substance in what Jefferson said as what Mao said, but that would never we would never consider that because we'd never get to that point. And that's kind of what I'm suggesting, is that the missing element in our education system to a large degree, it seems to me, is the is the ability to apply what what the educational psychologists refer to as higher order skills and what i mean is the cognitive skills of critical reading and analysis excuse me and analysis and bringing questions to content asking the right questions and know where to go and and uh, you know what questions to ask and excuse me and all the rest of it. And so the sum total is what, what we may have blundered into here with these two statements on leadership by Jefferson and Mao Zedong, what we might have blundered into is an indication as to where some of the major gaps, major flaws in our system of education might actually reside, might actually live. Because in a sense, we know that those students who are in the very best educational environments are taught to and encouraged to apply these skills. But students who are not in the more prestigious educational environments are not encouraged to do that. In fact, they are really discouraged from doing that because they are suggested, because they are basically, be, you know, being told that look for cues, look for hints as to what's worth reading and what, what's worth your time and not, what's not worth your time, and that way it becomes much more efficient and you don't waste your valuable time. And the result is we have so many students not wasting their valuable time thinking that we tend to be turning out large numbers of students who literally can't think in cognitive terms because they've really never been shown how, they've never had the opportunity to. And I think that I think that's pretty I think that's pretty significant, if indeed it is true. So we were there yesterday. And then we, if you remember, we totally shifted gears and we looked at a at a, at a couple of key paragraphs out of Jürgen Heideking's book on the Confederation period and ratification of the Constitution. And specifically, it was just one issue, but I seem to think it was a very valuable issue that all of us ought to know. And so if you are the type that makes, you know, if you make notes to yourself, or if you perhaps have a, have a, a you know, a program or a, a file folder on your, in, on your computer, where well, you have ideas and references and things that I need to go and look at or whatever, then you might want to basically take note 
of this particular topic in Jürgen Heideking's book. It's on page 100, and it extends probably for a couple of pages, probably to 102, 103. And what Heideking does, which seems rather minor, doesn't seem to be that significant, but I feel that it's quite significant. What he does is look at some of the major architects of the Constitution, Madison, Washington, Jefferson, Tench Cox, Rufus King, uh, and, and, and many others. And basically what he's talking about is the extent to which ratification can be, in part at least, understood by recognizing the communication network that the founders were, that the Federalists were able to develop during the period from September 1787 when the Constitutional Convention adjourned up until ratification is completed in the summer of 1788. And basically the, the, the issue that Heideking raises are the numbers of letters that are exchanged between Washington and Madison, between Madison and Jefferson, between, you know, again, the other way, between Jefferson and Madison. And what it suggests is that the flow of information, the flow of analysis among leading Federalists became extremely important in helping to secure ratification in state after state after state. And especially toward the end of the ratification process, when the key states, the big states of Virginia and New York were on the table, that's when these communication networks that had been developed in previous months became very, very valuable. And, I, you know, over the years, I, I've looked many times at different letters. The May 5th letter from Jefferson to, to Madison, or the, or the May 14, 1787 letter from Jefferson in France to George Washington, or whatever it might be. And I've noticed that there are a number of letters back and forth between the same people. But I never took the time to actually count them. Heideking did. And what those numbers mean, the quantification that he's done, indicates the strength of the network and the power of the communication between states and leaders that made ratification possible. It gave the Federalists a tremendous advantage. The other thing that we spent a little bit of time on yesterday, without we didn't look at the documents, and we'll do this in, in a future program because I think it's I think it's very valuable. We got into a little bit about Je uh, Luther Martin's genuine information. Luther Martin was an anti-Federalist uh, member of the convention from Maryland. He was an attorney. And as we talked about yesterday, he was well known, everybody kind of knew it, that Luther Martin um, was an alcoholic. And the fact of the matter is his gen genuine information, which is a topic-by-topic -topic analysis of the Constitution and what major problems he has with it, is brilliant. And the thing that I wanted to make clear is that none of the Federalist leaders took on Luther Martin directly. In other words, they did not set out to refute his analysis of the dangers, what he saw as the dangers of the Constitution. Instead, they set out about to besmirch the reputation of Luther Martin. The idea being that if you destroy the man's credibility, then you don't have to deal with the substance of what he says. And, and I, I, I believe historically that that is indeed what happened. I also think, on the same score, I also think something else. Many of us, you know, for, for all through our, from the time we started grade school, every one of us knows the name Patrick Henry. And every one of us knows the name Patrick Henry from the idea of give, give me liberty, give me death, the very famous speech that Patrick Henry made at St. John's Church on, uh, uh, in, in, in Richmond, Virginia. 
the fact of the matter is Patrick Henry's career extends way beyond 1776. He becomes probably the most noteworthy of Virginia's governors. Patrick Henry is, is one of the most popular governors, governors that Virginia ever had. He is a leading opponent of the Constitution of the United States. He is considered to be the nation's premier orator. If you read Madison, Madison is very, very open and very willing to praise the oratory of Patrick Henry. And he makes the point during the he makes the point during the Virginia Convention. He makes the point during the Virginia Convention. Have a phone ringing in the background. I apologize for that. Um, Madison makes the point during the Virginia Convention that there is no way that you can get ratification of the Constitution through the ratifying con convention in Virginia unless you take very seriously the arguments and the oratory of Patrick Henry. So in a sense, in order to get the full, a full appreciation of the historical value of the ratification convention in Virginia, it's very important to recognize that it pitted the oratory of Patrick Henry against the cognitive and analytical skill of James Madison. And it is a classic struggle. It's almost like an NBA playoff final between a team that puts the emphasis on what they call bigs, in other words, height, as opposed to a team that puts the emphasis on, on small and speed and which one has the advantage and of course everybody knows that when you're looking in, in basketball you know that when you're looking at a team with height and power and rebounding advantage that gives specific advantages to that team but everybody also knows that if you put the emphasis on 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 less size on small but with a lot more speed, then there are distinct advantages that a team with speed has over a team with size. And, of course, it's always a toss-up as you read different opinions and projections as to which of those two sets of priorities is going to win out in the end. That's the basis of the struggle in Virginia between the, the brilliance the oratorical brilliance of Patrick Henry and the analytical skills of James Madison who drafted the Virginia plan, the original Constitution. The point I'm trying to make is our young people graduate from school associating Patrick Henry with a speech that he made before the Declaration of Independence in Richmond, Virginia. But because Patrick Henry was on the losing side in, in the ratification struggle, he doesn't get nearly the credit that he, that he deserves for the oratorical skill, for the degree to which he was able to stretch Madison and stretch the Federalists in Virginia in order to get the Constitution through the Virginia Ratifying Convention. In fact, if you read the story of that convention, it's very clear that had Madison not, rather unwillingly at first, had Madison not dropped his opposition to a Bill of Rights for the Constitution and finally agreed that he would endorse and support the addition of a Bill of Rights once the new government went into effect, and that if elected to the first Congress, he would make it his own personal responsibility to see that a Bill of Rights was, was 
a priority in the first Congress under the new Constitution. Because Madison realized politically that there was no way that the Constitution was going to get through the, rati get through the Virginia Ratifying Convention as long as Patrick Henry and George Mason and some of the other leading anti-federalist voices could point to the lack of a Bill of Rights and suggest that the mere absence of a protection of individual rights seemed to suggest some sort of an aristocratic plot against average citizens. It became easier to give in and agree to support a Bill of Rights than it was for Madison and the others to try to explain why it wasn't necessary. For a long time, Madison was able to do that. But finally, he recognized that the Constitution was not going to be successful in Virginia unless he caved on the issue of a Bill of Rights. And from that point on, Madison actually became a fan of a Bill of Rights. He became a major supporter of the Bill of Rights. And, of course, the fact of the matter is, when the first Congress met, James Madison emerged as the chair of the committee that drafted a Bill of Rights, and Madison was heading up the committee that sifted through the more than 230 amendments that were proposed from the various states that had ratified the Constitution and screened out all the particular amendments that Madison believed detracted from the new power of the new federal government and ended up with what we know as our Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments. Actually, Madison's committee approved 12 amendments and sent them out. And of those 12, 10 were adopted, and those 10 become our Bill of Rights. And so it, you know, it's, it's very, very important to recognize the political context within which hap this happens. And I think because Madison tends to be on the winning side, and Patrick Henry is on the losing side, student, our students, our young people, don't even know, for the most part, that Patrick Henry was even involved in the debates over the Constitution of the United States. Clearly, they don't recognize the reputation for excellence that Patrick Henry had as a speaker. And it's only when you read Madison himself that you begin to get from Patrick Henry's greatest opponent Madison's willingness to acknowledge that Patrick Henry's skill as an opponent is something that must be taken very seriously. And Madison says at one point, it doesn't matter whether you are, are in support of something that Patrick Henry supports or whether you're in support of something that Matt Patrick Henry opposes. The fact of the matter is, you're not going to get anywhere unless you take seriously the position and the oratorical skills of one Patrick Henry. If he's on your side, he becomes a tremendous ally. If he emerges as your opponent, then it's an obstacle that you must take very, very seriously. Because if you don't, Patrick Henry will carry the day. And I, I, I personally believe that that's very, very important. And that's why, it seems to me, we need to, we need to look at the primary source material. We need to get away from going to textbooks for our information. Because by definition, textbooks are an effort to explain the facts from people who have been through the primary source material, who have done the research, and have formulated a particular point of view, an interpretation or an opinion. And what that means is that in writing the textbook, they are basically laying out the groundwork for the way that they interpret that particular issue. And if, if as a student, you take seriously the, the idea that a textbook merely is a compendium of information, contains only the facts. 
then what you are doing is taking as unalterable truth the interpretive opinions of historians who have done research and are basically arguing for an agenda. And I think, I think that's very, very important for us to, to, to recognize. We are at the bottom of the hour, our first hour together today. Again, our phone number, area code 304-658-3333. My email address, waobrien906 at gmail.com. I mentioned yesterday, shifting gears, and at the top of the hour we'll take a, a five-minute break and we'll, we'll actually get a chance to get up and walk around a little bit and hopefully re reflect on some things that might be worth thinking about. One of the things I mentioned yesterday that, that I had intended to do yesterday but that I would get to today is to return to the issue of the national security agencies um, eavesdropping scandal, if you will, the information on the eavesdropping network that was released some time ago now by Edward Snowden, who has since been fired uh, as a as an employee of the National Security Administration, uh, National Security Agency, and I mentioned that one of the best pieces and most meaningful pieces that I've seen is a piece that appeared in the New York Times on the 16th, which would have been Sunday, by Bill Keller, who, you, who for a while served as editor of the op-ed page in the New York Times, but now has gone back to writing a couple of columns a week. He's one of the most knowledgeable and perceptive political minds in the country, I believe. Anyway, Bill Keller makes a few points about this eavesdropping situation that I think are well worth some attention and at least some reflection. People who claim to understand and know and have an opinion about this particular issue need to at least take a moment to reflect on some of the very incisive comments that Bill Keller brings to the table on this particular issue. The first thing that he does, and, and I, I mentioned this on the air uh, in a previous program last week, the first thing that Bill Keller does is go back to the piece on the surveillance issue on the National Security Agency written last week by Tom Friedman in the New York Times. And for those of you who may not remember it or, or perhaps missed it, Friedman's very brilliant column on this suggests that in weighing the controversy, and this is basically the issue on which people tend to take sides, the conflict between our need to be secure from terrorist attacks on the one hand and the damage that a surveillance program this extensive does to American civil liberties, to the privacy rights of our citizens. And again, I am aware that, and I'm sure you are as well, that there is no right to privacy spelled out per se in the Constitution of the United States or in the Bill of Rights. You can find a couple of places in the Bill of Rights where privacy seems to be implied. But over the years, the courts, in their interpretation of the Constitution, the courts have created kind of a paper trail of opinions which seem to document the existence of a right to privacy as a constitutional right protected under the Constitution of the United States. And this issue of privacy is the one most frequently that conservative critics of the idea of a living Constitution focus on. 
Their point being that the right to privacy is a major example of liberals' inclination to read things into the Constitution that aren't even there and thereby to claim that the Constitution, because it is a living document, must continually change in order to meet changing circumstances. And so the conservative justices on the court, the most obvious one being Antonin Scalia, but Judge Alito, Judge Thomas, Clarence, uh, Clarence Thomas, um, and John Roberts, the Chief Justice, being the four major conservatives on the court right now, they will, off that this, they will counter the idea of the living Constitution with the idea of original intent, that the only legitimate way to interpret the Constitution is to look at what's in it and to recognize that if what you're looking for isn't in it, then it's not there. And they tend to disparage and to put down the focus on portions of the Constitution, like the Necessary and Proper Clause, which becomes a way that rights that the Constitution didn't specifically give to the federal government are claimed as rights anyway. And again, conservatives' critics will point to privacy as a classic example of what over the years liberals have tried to do with the Constitution. They've literally tried to make law by reading into the Constitution things that aren't there, things that the founders didn't, in, didn't put in there. And, that constant, and, and consequently, their argument is the Constitution is not being interpreted, uh, you know, with, with any, what they believe, with, with credibility or with validity. So this debate over the issue of privacy on the one hand and civil liberties versus the rights of the people in America to be secure, to be safe, that seems to be the dividing line on either side of which positions on this whole eavesdropping situation seem to fall. Last week, Tom Friedman wrote a very, very brilliant op-ed piece in the New York Times. In fact, Bill Keller makes the point that Friedman's piece soared to the top of what he calls the most emailed list. In other words, this particular piece was the one that received the most comments, the most commentary, and was referenced the most by other people who chose to write on the same issue. That speaks to the credibility and to the, to the power and substance of what Friedman's position says. And very briefly, what Friedman is saying is that Americans made a choice a long time ago that if it was privacy on the one hand or security on the other, the priority had to be on security. And Friedman points out that the real issue here, debates notwithstanding, the real issue here is that what Americans want more than anything else is to not be vulnerable to another 9-11, to another terrorist attack like 9-11. And so as we hear testimony, which is going on right now before congressional committees, yesterday we heard the, uh, the Joint Chiefs inform uh, the, a congressional committee that it's this surveillance program as much as anything else that has intercepted more than 50 specific terrorist plots against the United States since 9-11. Friedman's position is there's no question that in order for us to be secure in this technological age from terrorism then it's absolutely essential that we be willing to give up some of our 
liberties in order to secure our safety. And Friedman's position is weighing those two options, most Americans clearly would choose safety over civil liberties. And Friedman's position is, and I agree with them, that's the same choice that Friedman makes. Bill Keller does not really question Friedman's position. In fact, this is what he says. Tom's important point was that the gravest threat to our civil liberties is not the National Security Agency, but another 9-11 scale catastrophe that could leave a panicky public willing to ratchet up the security state even beyond the war on terror excesses that followed the last big attack. This is important. Subtle, but important. Friedman's point is that if we relax our security, if we allow ourselves to become vulnerable to another 9-11 attack, then the aftermath of that attack is going to effectively obliterate our civil liberties totally. Because if we experience two 9-11s, then people are going to become so adamant about their security that they won't even care a whit about civil liberties at all. And Friedman's position is better to give up some of our civil liberties now in exchange for security than risk another attack, but especially risk the response to another task which would be effectively the end of our, we would become a police state. People would become so paranoid about security if we were to experience another 9-11 that free speech and free press and freedom of assembly and all the other things that we take, that we value so highly would be pushed into the background or pushed off the table entirely. So Friedman's position, reasoning is that the best thing we can do to preserve our civil liberties is to give up some of them now in exchange for the security that ultimately is most important. That's the position that Friedman takes. That's the position that Bill Keller is pointing out and supports. And Bill Keller re goes on and says, reluctantly, Friedman concludes that a well-regulated program to use technology in defense of liberty even if it gives us the creeps, is a price we pay to avoid a higher price, the shutdown of the world's most open society. And then he says, hold on to that qualifier while regulated. So what Keller is doing is agreeing with Friedman, but at the same time he's raising a flag. And what he's saying basically is, as we concede portions of our civil liberties, we need to do so very carefully and very advisedly. Because he says the NSA data mining is part of something much larger. It's not just access to information. On many fronts, Keller says, we are adjusting to life in a surveillance state relinquishing bits of privacy in exchange for the promise of other rewards. We have a vague feeling of uneasiness about these transactions, but it rarely translates into serious thinking about where we set the limits. Keller's point, this is the takeoff for his, his, his entire article. His point is, while we surrender these bits of civil liberties, this, these portions of our privacy, we need to constantly keep in mind how far do we go? Where do we draw the line? How do we ensure that this mining for data, this eavesdropping on our emails and our cell phone calls and all the rest of it, 
how do we ensure that these are well regulated? How do we control the surrender of civil liberties in exchange for increased effectiveness of security? And what Keller does then is point out some of the dangers of not doing this carefully. And I think each of the exhibits that he uses are very, very informative. And so I'd like to, I'd like to take some time in our program today to look at these, because I think this is stuff that all of us need to think about. We may not want to go back to them again. We may not, you know, think that they necessarily might be worthy of this kind of discussion. I personally think they are. I'm one of these people that is very, very concerned about the surrender of our civil liberties in exchange for security. Because one of the things that I've learned over the years as I've studied and read about and taught history is that governments are not above exaggerating the threats to security in order to win concessions in the area of civil rights and civil liberties. That's an important point. There is example after example in our history to suggest that government has been more than willing on occasion after occasion to exaggerate threats in order to win concessions from the people in the areas of civil rights and civil liberties and government's desire to secure information and data. We don't live in a perfect world. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take to the bank, if we could trust 100% the fact that what we were being told is pure, unadulterated truth. But the fact of the matter is, we know historically that there's too much evidence that at times, in particular circumstances, that's not true. Let me give just one example. Uh, the one that comes most readily to my mind is Watergate. One of the things that became clear that surfaced during the, the Watergate investigation, especially with the tapes, President Nixon's tapes, that became public knowledge that were released primarily with the blessing of the Supreme Court telling President Nixon that these things had to be made public. One of the things we learn is that in order to cover up Watergate, the Nixon administration on more than one occasion was willing to risk international activity. Let me, let me put it this way. President Nixon makes the point at least, one, at least once I remember hearing, but probably more than that, on these tapes, that there's nothing that will bring the people of this country together more than a war. If we want people to put aside their concerns about Watergate, and all come to the defense of my administration, there's no better, more efficient way to do that than to involve the nation in some sort of foreign conflict. Create an enemy, create a sense of threat, and people will logically make the connection and say, civil liberties are important but the threats to the nation are greater and they will tend then they will tend to back off the same things happened with iraq the war in iraq and the the, the fruitless search for saddam's weapons of mass destruction it was the reputed existence of those weapons that justified the attack on iraq itself the whole war was based on the premise, people's fear, that Saddam 
had weapons of mass destruction and would use them. The proof was that in the early 80s, he used them on his own people. The point is that evidence throughout history is, is very, very frequent to suggest that governments are more than adept at instigating or creating threats in order to force people to abandon concern about civil liberties and replace that concern with a greater concern for their own security and their own safety of the nation. So because this is so easily possible, because it's happened so many times before, Keller is pointing out that we, we tend to be on kind of a slippery slope here. We can't surrender civil liberties too easily, too quickly. Because once you do it, you can't get them back. And so we need to be very, very carefully and very, very careful and very suspicious about what we do and the conditions under which we do it. Let me share with you his Exhibit A, and I think you'll understand. Keller points out that in last Thursday's time, now remember this is written on the 16th of, uh, of June, which was Sunday. So this would have been a week ago in the New York Times. In an article by Joseph Goldstein, Kel Keller says, In last Thursday's time, Joseph Goldstein reported that local law enforcement agencies, and this is in quotes, largely under the radar, unquote, are amassing their own DNA data banks. And they often don't play by the rules laid down for databases compiled by the FBI and state, and state crime labs. Everybody who watches television, if you watch Law and Order or, or any of these other things, you will know that DNA has replaced fingerprints as the most sub substantive, secure, reliable, take-to-the-bank evidence. And the number of people who have been in, you know, improperly jailed over the years and are exonerated as a result of DNA evidence, sometimes it comes up years later in these so-called cold cases, it's very obvious that the existence of DNA as forensic evidence has become generally ex accepted and the credibility of that evidence is huge. And what Goldstein pointed out in his article is that local law enforcement agencies are building up their own DNA data banks, sometimes in accordance with the rules of the game, but sometimes not. Keller goes on, as a society, we have accepted DNA evidence as a reliable tool, both for bringing the guilty to justice and for exonerating the wrongly accused. Just made that point. But do we want police, but do we want police agencies, please excuse the phone, but do we want police agencies to have complete license? Example, to sample our DNA surreptitiously. Do we want police agencies to collect DNA from people who aren't accused of doing anything wrong or to share our most private biological information? In order for the DNA database to become more reliable, you've got to have everybody's DNA. So it's not a matter of just collecting DNA from alleged criminals or convicted criminals or felons. In order to make the potential of DNA fully realized, the most effective thing we can do is get everybody's DNA. And many local police agencies are setting about doing just that. Barry Sheck, you may remember Barry Sheck, he was 
uh, very, very involved, as I recall, in the O.J. Simpson television extravaganza from the, uh, uh, that, that happened many years ago. Barry Sheck, who's now co-director of the Innocence Project and a member of the New York State Commission on Forensic Science, says, this is all in Keller's article, says that regulators have been slow to respond seem to be doing some coughing today. I apologize. Barry Sheck says that regulators have been slow to respond to what he calls rogue databases. A recent Supreme Court ruling, he says, that defined DNA gathering as a legitimate police practice comparable to fingerprinting is likely to encourage more freelancing of collecting DNA. Sheck says his fear is that misuse will arouse public fears of government overreach and discredit one of the most valuable tools in our justice system. And this is a quote from Barry Sheck. If you ask the American people, he says, do you support using DNA to catch criminals and exonerate the in innocent? Everybody says yes. If you ask, do you trust government to have your DNA Everybody says no. And that's a quote from Barry Schick. What are we saying here? The implication of this particular exhibit in Bill Keller's piece is that the only way to realize the full potential of DNA evidence is to make sure that the database is as complete as possible. Which means you can't just trust the criminals and convicted felons to, to give access to their DNA. In order for it to work, you've got to have everybody's DNA. Otherwise, you're operating on the assumption that the only people that ever commit crimes are people who have previously committed them before. If you buy that assumption, which obviously none of us do, if you buy that assumption that the only people that commit crimes are criminals, then collecting DNA evidence only from the convicted felons or, or people convicted or, or charged with a crime would be sufficient. But if crime is ever going to be committed, by people for the first time for whom there is no DNA evidence, people whose DNA is not in the data bank, if that's going to happen, then the only way that you can realize the full potential of DNA evidence is to include everybody's DNA in the data bank. And that raises serious issues of privacy and civil liberties. Does government have the right to come to me who, have not, who has not been charged with committing a crime and say we want to basically include your DNA in our data bank as a way to create a much more effective, much more secure and reliable database? Barry Sheck's comment is when you ask people, do you agree with the use of DNA evidence, Everybody says yes. But when you approach them with the idea, can we include your DNA in the database, everybody says no. So in a sense, what Bill Keller is suggesting here is we need to be very, very careful and very cognitive of how quickly we go down this slippery slope. Because once you go down there, it's hard to climb back. And to go back to the very beginning of his piece, which is bas basically Tom Friedman's argument, if we ever find ourselves once again attacked as we were in 9-11, then people are going to become so security conscious that they'll be willing to surrender all right to civil liberties in exchange for security. And once that happens, 
civil liberties will, the, the most open society in the history of the world will become a closed society as so many other societies have been through our history. That's Bill Keller's first exhibit. I think it's very, very significant. I think all of those people that are emphasizing security over civil liberties need to think about it. On the other hand, I think all those people who are putting a premium on civil liberties need to understand the realities of the world we live in. In order to basically reach or guarantee a degree of security, it's going to be very, very important that some of our civil liberties and civil rights probably are going to have to be given up in the process. How to do that and do it in a way which doesn't exceed what we need to do becomes the real challenge. We are at uh, one minute after the top of the hour. Let's pause and take a four or five minute break. We'll come back and we'll complete our last hour in today's program. I'm Bill O'Brien. You're listening to the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution. And after a brief, brief pause, we'll be right back. Good afternoon again. This is Bill O'Brien. I apologize for the break. I took a minute or two more than I usually do. Um, we, uh, my wife and I spent a good portion of the day looking at cars and uh, entertaining offers and, and uh, interest rates and all of that stuff. And so um, it's a little bit chaotic uh, here as other things are going on at the same time. But uh, So I, I was gone an extra moment or two, and I, I apologize for that. Uh, our phone number, uh, again, area code 304-658-3333. That's area code 304-658-3333. And my email address, waobrien906 at gmail.com. That's waobrien906 at gmail.com. If you are just joining us for today, we welcome you to today's edition of the Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution. If you've been with us since the opening of our program an hour ago, we thank you for staying with us. That means a lot. If you if you are with us, and I, I got a uh, an email uh, today from a listener, and it was a very very positive email. I didn't. I'm not going to read it because it, it it it's very positive. It made me feel very good. But basically, the the person had said that that um, he's been going back through previous programs that uh, that listens when he can uh, to the live broadcast. Uh, but when he's not able to do that, he picks them up on, uh, on broadcast through White Rose. I think that's significant. I appreciate the heck out of that, and I, I want him to know that, but I also want you to know how much I appreciate it. I appreciate your willingness to spend time with us. It's pretty, it's pretty Im important to me th th because it, 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 I, I take it seriously. It, to me, it's a responsibility. It's a responsibility to work hard, and it's a responsibility to do my best to make sure that if you're willing to invest time in this in, in, in this program, then I need to invest the the adequate time to make the program worth your time, and I commit to doing that. And again, I I, I don't want to go into the same thing again as we've done in previous programs. But the fact of the matter is, you know as well as I do, that there's a very, very important, very significant ideological war going on in America, it seems to me, for, for support, for indoctrination and support. And one of the things that becomes more and more evident all the time is that an awful lot of our citizens are pretty pretty uninformed about some of the issues that fact more than anything else is what led me to believe to want to do a program like this and I like to believe and I know I know it's true that that same issue that same fact is what prompts Bob Kincaid and uh, and others to to bring the head-on radio network into our homes each day. It's very, very important to keep that program on the air, that network on the air. I'm honored 
that Bob and his folks have chosen to give us the time to share with you some of these ideas and some of this content on the Constitution of the United States. It's very important. I believe it's incredibly important. I also realize that being a citizen in a republic like this is pretty serious business. And it, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. And I appreciate it, and I appreciate head on the horn for giving us the opportunity to have these, these hours together. I appreciate it very, very much. And, and again, I, I hope that you will do whatever you can to help Bob and his folks keep head on on the air because it's very, very important that we keep this voice and this perspective out there because, very honestly, our people need it. Um, we were looking at Bill Keller's piece in the New York Times this past Sunday on the National Security Agency eavesdropping situation, database collecting, and we were looking at his cautions about putting so much stock in the need for security that we are too willing, too ready to surrender our civil, our civil liberties and specifically talking about privacy. And the first one that we looked at was the issue of DNA. And the fact of the matter is the only way to make the DNA to make DNA evidence more and more reliable is to make sure that the data bank includes the DNA of, of as many people as possible. Hey, What's Dr. Bill? <laughs> yes, Bob? I just thought I'd let you know you've got a caller on the line. Oh, okay, Bob. I appreciate that. Thank uh, you. And, and it's not just any caller. It's, oh. your, it's your brother. Oh, wow. <laughs> so let me put him on. All right. I think we still speak. <laughs> right. All right. Stand by. Thank you, Bob. Hey there. Hey, bro. How are you? I'm, I'm fine. <clears throat> and I have a bad head cold thingy uh, with this, uh, with the allergies and stuff like that. So you excuse my. Oh yeah, you really, you really, I can tell you do. Yeah, it's just breaking up, and it's really. But uh, well, I was thinking you were talking about security and um, and how much rights we have to give up and this and that. And, you know, uh, I was thinking that, like, about 10 years ago or so, nobody wanted any security cameras around in the public places, you know. And now, I mean, we've caught the Boston uh, bombers with the security cameras, and I think it was worth having the cameras there to get rid of these people off the street. And um, you know, that's, that's just, um, so you have to give, I guess, a little something to get something. That's that's Paul. That's exactly the the gist of the, uh, you know, of Friedman's piece. And I, I appreciate what you're saying because that is exactly his point. That in order to get something, you got to give up something. Yeah. And what Ke and Keller, you know, Bill Keller doesn't disagree with that. But his argument is, while you are giving things up, you need to do it very very consciously. You need to be aware that you are giving something up, and you need to do it very very carefully and very very shrewdly and, and I, I, I think I agree with them as well and I, I kind of think you probably do too yes uh, and uh, you know I was also thinking like um, I don't know how many years ago they started putting in electronic devices on the on the turnpikes and stuff like that and um, uh, and I've used it over the years going uh, I live about 35 miles out of Boston and I drive into Boston on the mass pike most of my working career and um, so it made it a lot easier. I'd eliminate a lot of the lines were, that were making change and all that stuff. Sure. And I'd zip right through. But but in, in the in one respect, I'm losing my my anonymity and everything because now they know where I am at what time and like that. Oh yeah, and you, yeah. They can they can basically time you almost to the to the to the minute. You go through the same time every day. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. So you you you. 
you're not anonymous anymore just driving around. You know, they can kind of no. track you. And I'm sure, I'm sure some lawyers and stuff like that have used those type of things. You know, right. You know, type of things against you. But, um, you know, it was, it was um, we gave up that little freedom to get um, right. speed going through the toll, go, toll gates and all you, yeah, and that's the whole point. You, you're getting something that is considered to be very, very valuable, but it's never free. Right. right. You know, you, you're always giving up something. I think Keller's p- point probably is that we just need to be aware that we are giving things up, and we need to consciously never lose sight of the fact as to how much of it we are giving up. Because once it's gone, it's gone. Yes, right. right. Can't, and you can't get it back. That's right. That's right. And, and with the technology improving the way it is it seems to be clear to me at least that that the potential of this is incredible we can do things now that even during 9-11 we couldn't do you know and and um you know technology is making it so uh so possible to get access to information that we could never get before and if you if you're able to do that without taking seriously people's rights to privacy and protection of the civil liberties, then then you're in a police state. Then you've really lost it. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. And, you know. Um, well, listen. Let me let me ask. Are you are you feeling okay? You you, you sound I tough. Feel, I feel um, actually a little better this afternoon, but usually when it's for us because I think it's all breaking up. You know? Usually when it's breaking up, that's when you start to feel better. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know. Listen, you gotta you, you gotta rest up and be in good shape tonight because the Bruins are playing tonight. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> I know you I'll and I talk... lose, but what little voice I have, I'll lose it. <laughs> yeah, you and I, you and I, of course, are, are big fans of of the Bruins and hockey. So, so we we've, we've got our our it's our my daughter. Kind of for us. <laughs> my daughter is too. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Watching yeah. it too. Yeah. Now, well. Uh, anyway, I'm enjoying the show, Bill. And, uh, well, thanks. I appreciate you calling, and I appreciate you I saying that. It, I thought it was kind of, uh, you know, kind of fit into the the subject. You know, it does perfectly, and I thank you so much. Okay. And I'm glad you were able to to exchange a few words with Bob. Yeah, yeah. That was okay. very. Oh. Good. Well, listen. Thanks a million, guy. Okay, I'll talk. I appreciate you. it. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Uh, that was that was kind of a pleasant surprise for me. Uh, I usually talk. We usually talk later in the evening, especially tonight. We'll talk after the after the Bruins game. We we always do. We're, we're both big big hockey fans, and um, uh, but I but I appreciate it. And Paul's right. It it uh, it, uh, it it his point does fit in here. And the thing about security cameras, it's kind of ironic that <laughs> this is the second exhibit that Bill Keller uses is the use of cameras. And I think Paul nailed it. And that's really the whole that's really the whole point that once we begin to understand some of these issues and look at the ramifications, you can pretty well predict and pr- project exactly where this argument is going to go. And that's one of the most interesting things to if if you can get students to work with you enough to let them know that. It once they begin to read well if you can teach students to improve their their reading skills and to read more critically and what that means is to really understand not only what people are saying but what the implications are of what they're saying and once you can get people to read at that level then it becomes much easier to predict where the next where that particular argument is going or what the next point is going to be. And once students are able to do this, then their reading comprehension increases, you know, many-fold because it's, it's much easier to comprehend what you read if you were able to anticipate what the subject is going to be before you even read it. And in order to do that, it requires focus and it requires skill. But more important, it requires opportunity. And so I think I think the fact that Paul basically raised the issue of cameras is particularly relevant 
because that's the second exhibit that Bill Keller raises. And let me let let me quickly go through it because there's no reason to spend a lot of time. I think you know I think those of you right now are pretty well able to predict or to guess the kinds of things that Bill Keller is going to say. Nothing quite nothing quite says Big Brother Keller says like closed circuit television. In Orwell's Britain which is probably the democratic world's leading practitioner of CCTV monitoring, the omnipresent pole-mounted cameras are being supplemented in some jurisdictions by wearable night vision cop cams that police use to record every drunken driver, domestic violence call, and rest of crowd they encounter. The technology of cameras, as as my brother Paul made the point. That's the way we got the Boston Marathon bombers. I can remember the video of them walking around as people began to examine all the the hours of of video that was available prior to the bombing at the at the conclusion at the finish line of the Boston Marathon. And then basically, once you look at it very carefully, you can pick up those who are most suspicious, and that's the way we got. A line on on who on who basically set off those those bombs. Keller goes on. New York last year joined with Microsoft to introduce the eerily named Domain Awareness Program system, which connects 3,000 CCTV cameras and license plate scanners and radiation detectors around the city and allows police to cross-reference databases of stolen cars wanted criminals, and suspected terrorists. Fans of TV thrillers like Homeland 24 and the British series MI5 have come to think of the omnipresent camera as a crime-fighting godsend. But who watches the watchers? Announcing the New York system, the city assured us that no one would be monitored because of race, religion, citizenship status, political affiliation, etc. To which one skeptic replied, we've heard that one before. So knowing the potential of using race, religion, citizenship status, political affiliation, all of it, as a basis for looking at security camera information, it stands to reason that those who are using these cameras would deny that they're going to use it in an illegal, in an illegal or discriminatory way. But the fact of the matter is, it's too easy not to, if you think about it. And so, in a sense, the value of cameras as a crime-fighting godsend, that's a direct quote from Bill Keller's article, is offset by the extent to which they include all of us. President Obama is going out of his way to reassure us that while the national security agencies has access to our cell phone calls and to our emails and all the rest of it, no conversations are being listened to, no emails are being read, unless there's a reason to do it. Unless some sort of grid connection between an overseas suspicious number, perhaps, or something like that might might happen. That's the only basis on which um, on which these kind. I apologize for the phone in the background. That's the only way, the only basis on which we would be we would rest assured that this technology would not be abused at the extent of our own civil rights and civil liberties. In other words, we are being assured. By government and by and, and, and by by our president and by Congress and by police agencies and everything else, 
that this technology is only being used on the up and up and is not being abused. And the point of the, of the point is we you know we have to trust in that, but the question is, does history suggest that we should? And Keller points out that what we're left with here is reassurance from those with the capabilities of violating our privacy that they won't do it. Hey, Dr. Yeah. Bill? Yes, Bob. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, uh, you've got another caller. Jeff is on the line for you. Well, I thank you. All right, stand by. Thank you, Bob. Hello, Bill. Uh, I, I, I have to take... I, will, I don't believe our government is going to... Uh, is, 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 is bugging our phone calls for anything other than uh, trying to get our background for... It, it's an economic problem here. This is not... They're mining our... our, our, buying. Uh, 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 our, our buying habits. That's what they're doing. I mean, they want to know how far we travel. They want to know. They want to know. It's all kind of mining this stuff for economic purposes. Oh, I... I, I you, you see where I'm going with this? I'm not saying it. I don't believe our government's out there to, you know, um, to, 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 to attack my property because I'm going to say something against my government. I can't buy that. But I, I can buy that economic... The economic... Uh, they're killing us. The economics is killing us, but... They want us to keep. They're just binding our. Did you run going down? Sorry. Go ahead. They're mining our habits. They're mining our habits, and that's what they. That's how they make. That's how they. They, they keep the the wealth right. flowing to, or, or our labor coming to them. That's all they're doing. I and don't they, believe it's going to kill us. You know, I, I, I don't buy that. No, they are able to grid to 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 capture our behavior patterns and our buying patterns. That's exactly right. And they know, and then they know basically what we're going to be most susceptible to when they try to sell us something. Exactly. So the so the problem here is not the 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 underlying secretness of the government. It's the problem here is the economic system. If you, every one of these things, if you look back and step back a bit, you can trace it directly back to the economic system. To be, the, the political system, according to you, which I've learned from you, is working exactly the way it's supposed to. The uh -huh. wealthy people are the minority, and they have, using the minority power with their, their amount of economic uh, advantages, you know, the money, they're buying our politicians and, and they're playing the game. The problem here goes right back to the economic system. The question then remains, how far back and how do we, is it possible to address it to change the economic system so it works in, in the, benefit, the benefit of our political system, our educational system, and so on and so forth. The problem is not, we're, we're, going, we're, looking, we're looking for, for, for skeletons behind every, in every closet. It's not the skeletons. It's, it's very obvious when you step back and see what's going on. I, I don't mean to be... No. I'm going, I, I appreciate I appreciate what you're saying because what you're saying is so powerful. Well, my my point being is is, is is we're all so caught up in what's going on, and this is this is the you you even explained in the Constitution the Constitution was set up by elites to run the world by the elites, and it has not changed in 200 years, and going back thousands of years, it hasn't changed. So we have to figure out why it has to change and what we can do to change it to make change. it work. Do you, do you think that, and this is just a question, do you think that government is doing this for the private sector, or do you believe that government is creating the kind of situation which allows the private sector to do this? Because one of the things I, I, I've noticed is that private business is is far ahead in mining this data of government. We're blown away by the fact that our government is doing it, but our government's kind of the last one in line. I, I believe that the, the now the private business has is totally under control, uh, is totally controlling our government, and they are they want that's how we get it. Uh, our, our wars are privatized, which shouldn't be there in the first place. Are are they're privatizing 
you know, a, a post offices. They're privatizing roads. They're privatizing schools. I mean, this is outrageous because there's got to be a. And I have, by the way, I'm a capitalist, but I believe that you have to have a social, a certain amount of co- of collectivism, so you can give people the the um, what's the word I'm looking for. They're liberties. You people need liberties, so you need private. Everybody's got to have their own individualism, but you have to have some some um, some form of uh, of you know government. I mean, I, you've got to have a government that so people can have the ability to be to be individualist. So you need a balance here, and we've lost the balance where the a small group of private people are running the running the world government. And that's the problem. Do you, and and this is more or less of a, a you know, I, I, this is not something I necessarily believe, but I just wanted to throw it out there. Do you think that um, that if, and we've been talking about, you know, we need to give up some of our civil liberties in exchange for security. In order to get something, you've got to give up something. What if the something we're getting is economic growth and economic viability and jobs. I'm sorry, there is no such thing as economic growth. There is no such thing as economic growth because the economic system has never, ever worked for the poor. It's occasionally worked for some people in this country for a very short time in history, and it's always worked for the very wealthy. The economic system has never worked, and I'm suggesting a way of changing that system Somehow, but, and we're going to need more minds better than mine, but we need people to talk about how do we fix the, the monetary system, by the way, is intertwined with the economic system. The monetary system is exact, whether it's gold or silver or feathers or stones. If I owe you two stones and I give you one, I owe you one stone. That's very, very objective. But the economic system is totally subjective, so it can't possibly be fair for anyone, and it was never fair when the Constitution was written, and it wasn't fair two or four thousand years before the Constitution was written. So we need to get the economic system fixed. That's and that's the basic premise of the problem. No one uh-huh. sees it because we're so involved with it. I, so, in it, what you're saying effectively then is, if I were to make the point to you that if we stop mining this data for private sector access then the result is going to be damage to our economic system to the point that it's going to cost jobs, it's going to slow down the economy, it's going to cause layoffs because it's going to affect consumer behavior. Therefore, we don't have any alternative but to continue to go in the direction, but be assured that we will monitor it so that it will not be abused. You would never buy that. No, the reason why I don't buy it, I don't buy that. As I deal with with that, the social economic groups across the country, people who who are, are totally full pop poverty stricken, people who are very well. The reality is, if we put a twenty five hour work week or a twenty hour work week in place, and 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 set up a certain system just for that twenty hour work week, and by the way, that should be around the world. It shouldn't just be U.S. But if we can set a twenty hour work week up, there would be no unemployment. There would be everybody would have a job. And you just have to, you, but you must look at the economic system where the minimum wage, as everyone talks about the minimum wage, the minimum wage has to give you education, food, and shelter. So yeah. that's what the minimum wage should do. Not, otherwise the minimum wage is just a word. Freedom is just a word unless you have those three basic items. I, 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 but maybe I'll get more excited and tell you how I feel some other day. You know that, hey, can I ask you one more question? And you can, anything you want, I'm here. Well, I know because I really believe this is really good. This is really good stuff. Um, we've been talking over and over again about the th- the threat of data mining to civil liberties and, and individual civil rights. And you talk about the need to change the economic system in order to change this thing, which it's never been done. Do you have any? Do you have any thinking at all? Have you, have you done any thinking? as to what we would have to do in order to pull this off, in order to begin well, the process of change. Actually, I have, and I did, and I, oh, here's what happened. We were trying to, we were trying to work, we were, we were trying to work on a, we, the, the economic system right now is based 
on of fossil fuel, fossil fuel energy. The U.S. dollar is the primary currency of the world. To keep, to, 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 for buying fossil fuel, you must have a U.S. dollar. So we're basically on, a, on an energy currency. So we were looking for a renewable energy currency because I've been working with renewable energy for well over 30 years. So uh-huh. as we did it, we chased our tails because the dollar kept on moving. So we went to the value of the dollar. So we, we went to a physicist, and we said to the physicist, we need a measurement for what, for what renewable energy is worth. And he said, I've got that measurement for you. So I said, great, what is it? He said, well, here's the deal. It, it's 30, 30, I think we're losing a connection. I apologize. I think we, I think we got a bad connection and lost you. Oh man, what a call! Thank you so much. You've given us a lot to think about. I've got one other issue that I'm going to throw out there just for discussion, and if you, if you call back, we can revisit it. But I, but it's so pertinent to the to the call that you made and the issues that you raised that I don't want to le- I don't want to le- let the opportunity pass us by. What I'm wondering, and I'm and basing all of this on the things that you said in your call. It's your call that prompted, prompted this thinking. But I'm wondering whether, in fact, a way to begin to turn this around might be a much more general awareness of what the va- what the real value of civil rights and civil liberties is to the welfare of our republic, not just my right as an individual to be able to say what I want and speak what I want and go where I want and and gather together with other people with whom I want to be and, and freedom of the press and all the rest of it. That's the way most of us. It's an abstract sense of my right and my freedom. My freedom stops. My freedom to, sp- to swing my fist stops where your nose begins, if you remember that very famous expression, uh, that very famous statement from... I believe Oliver Wendell Holmes. But I'm wondering about a general awareness among the citizenry at large of why civil liberties are an an integral part of what our republic needs in order to function. And if we can adequately make that case, then it seems to me we can point out the dangers of the civil liberties surrender that we continually are involved in as more and more of our personal data and privacy is being compiled in these databases, is being mined. I'm wondering if citizen education might be the beginning of a process for change where the case is being made we can't continue to surrender more and more of our privacy and more and more of our civil liberties because the very nature of our republic, the ability of our republic to function, demands a certain degree of rights and liberties on the part of its citizens. And if we surrender too much of it, we're not doing abstract damage to our own individual rights. We're doing real damage to the operative capabilities of our own of our own political existence I don't know whether that makes sense or not but it's something that occurred to me as I was listening to the comments and the ideas of of that our second caller today and I want to thank you so so very much for that call it's absolutely absolutely critical and it's it's right on this issue is important I made the point yesterday I I mentioned in yesterday's program that I was speaking to our local Beckley Rotary Club yesterday here at noon. And and the point I make I made to the to the Rotarians at the time was all you have to do is read the op ed pieces and read the headlines in the papers over the last week to ten days. And if anybody tries to tell you that the that the Constitution of the United States is old stuff and it's dated history and we don't need it anymore. Just look at what's going on. If you don't believe that the concept, the Constitution continues to be an issue of relevance, then you, the, you're just not paying attention to what's happening all around us. And I think the two calls we got today 
uh, the, the one from Boston, from my brother in Massachusetts, uh, making mention of the Boston Marathon, uh, the solving of that case. And then this particular one on the whole issue of economic mining of data in order to basically allow people who are making money to make more. That's pretty, that's pretty powerful stuff. <laughs> For one afternoon, I think that's, I think that's very, very powerful stuff. Uh, I wanted to share with you because we, we're down to, we have about uh, 15, 16 minutes left in today's program. I wanted to share with you Bill Keller's third exhibit in his article about the concern for the sacrifice of civil rights and civil liberties and what it might mean. And here's his third. Congress has told the FAA to set rules for the use of spy drones in American airspace by 2015. The Federal Aviation Administration to set, to set rules for the use of drones in American airspace by the year 2015, which is two years from now. It's easy to imagine the value of this next frontier in surveillance. Monitoring forest fires, chasing armed fugitives, search and rescue operations, etc. Predator drones already patrol our southern border for illegal immigrants and drug smugglers. Indeed, border surveillance may be critical in persuading Congress to pass immigration reform that would extend our precious liberty to millions living in the shadows. I, for one, says Keller, would count that a fair trade. But where does that stop? Scientific American editorialized in March, quote, privacy advocates rightly worry that drones equipped with high-resolution video cameras, infrared detectors, and even facial recognition software will let snoops into realms that have long been considered private, unquote. And this particular example will resonate with all of us. Like your backyard, or with the sort of thermal imaging used to catch the Boston bombing fugitive hiding under a tarp in a boat, what's to keep this technology out of your bedroom? Think about it. Every one of us was glued to the television sets as the Boston police and the FBI were looking for the second Sinaiev brother. And they found him, found him hiding in a tarp, under a tarp, in a boat. But from helicopters, you could see them, you could see him with thermal, in, with thermal imaging. Heat. The heat would his boat technology from violating your workplace, your bedroom, uh, it doesn't matter where, is the only check we, got, we have self-assurance of those who have it that they won't abuse it? I think that that's a serious consideration that, that Keller raises. Then he says, there's the Internet. We seem pretty much at peace, verging on complacent, he says, about the exploitation of our data for commercial, medical, and scientific purposes. As trivial as advertising algorithm that pitches us camping gear because we search the web for wilderness travel. As valuable as the digital record sharing that makes sure all our detectives know what meds we're on. I get a call from our local my local drugstore every month letting me know that my patients have a free course. So what that means is I'm in the database of the drugstore. They know what medications I'm on, which means that I'm yet that you've got this disease and you've got that disease and you're taking this medication and you're taking that medication and you have to take your blood sugar or check your blood sugar on a regular basis and on and on and on. When you compile all of this with what goes across the scanner in the grocery store and was it high your 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 tools and materials, when you start combining all of that, you've got a pretty good record of who we are and what we do and what we value 
In fact, you've got a pretty good record, not only of the fact that, that I drink beer, but you even know what brand I drink. If I drink light beer, it's probably because you, you probably know that. And then when you start to ask yourself, why would he be drinking light beer? rather than whole beer, Heineken's or Sam Adams or something like that. Well, maybe it's because of particular medical problems he might, he might have. Let's check on that. Next comes across my list of prescriptions, and you say, ha-ha. Then the next question, the next stage would be, what do people with that, in that particular medical condition need to worry about? What is it that they need to be most susceptible to? Exercise equipment, joining a health club, becoming a member of the YMCA or something like that. And suddenly, there's a whole marketing package that can be put together, tailored just for me. Based on data that I gave away in small snippets, but somebody's out there compiling it all. Eric Posner, who's a professor at the University of Chicago Law School, and this is included in Bill Keller's piece, engaged in it, you know, in, engaged, it pointed out uh, when he's talking about a, 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 in, an online debate that we've grown pretty comfortable with the IRS knowing our finances. That's another thing, given what's been going on with the IRS. Because they've got our income taxes. They know what our tax deductions is, what charities we, we donate to, what property we own, what interest we pay, everything. We become quite comfortable with the IRS knowing our finances. We've be, Posner points out we've become comfortable with government hospitals knowing our medical histories. We've even become comfortable with school teachers knowing the abilities and the personalities of our own children. And this is a quote from Posner. The information vacuumed up by the NSA was already available to faceless bureaucrats in phone and Internet companies, not government employees, but strangers just the same. Many people write as though we make some great sacrifice by disclosing private information to others. But it is, in fact, simply the way that we obtain services we want, whether the market services of doctors, insurance companies, Internet service providers, employers, therapists, and the rest, or the non-market services of the government, like welfare and security. This is exactly the point our last caller made about the economic goals of mining all of this data. We have voluntarily given all of this up because it seems to be better for us. We get access to the information we need in order to be an intelligent shopper, an intelligent consumer. In effect, we're almost cloned as, as consumers. Private advocates, Keller said, will retort that we surrender this information wittingly. But in reality, most of us just let it slip away. We don't pay much attention to privacy settings or the terms of service fine print. Our two most common passwords are password and 123456. How many people use that as their PIN? 123456. From time to time, we get evidence of, of the misuse of data such as the last big revelation of NSA eavesdropping in 2005 when it was disclosed that the agency was tapping Americans without the legal nicety of getting a warrant for us. Remember that's, that story came out in 2005. Or the more recent IRS targeting of right-wing political groups. But in most cases the advantages of intrusive technology are tangible, and the abuses largely fall into the category of potential, not real. In other words, we're talking here about the what-ifs, not the is's. Edward Snowden's leaks about NSA data mining have so far not included evidence of any specific abuse. Not yet. 
but he's telling us there's, there's more to come. Keller concludes this way. The danger, it seems to me, he says, is not surveillance per se. We've already decided, most of us, that life on the grid entails a certain amount of intrusion. I think my brother Paul, when he called, made that point that in order to get something, you've, you've got to give up something. Most of us appreciate that. Nor is the danger of secrecy, which, as Posner states, is ubiquitous in a range of uncontroversial settings. A promise the government makes to protect past taxpayers, inventors, whistleblowers, informers, hospital patients, foreign diplomats, entrepreneurs, contractors, data suppliers, and many others. We are constantly getting reassurance from government that this data will not be used and that secrecy will not be abused. The danger, Keller says, is the absence of rigorous independent regulation and vigilant oversight to keep potential abuses of power from becoming a real menace to our freedom. The issue is the regulation part, the effectiveness of the controls. The founders created a system of checks and balances, but the safeguards have not kept up with the technology. Instead, we have an executive branch in a leak, fren leak hunting frenzy, a Congress that treats oversight as a form of partisan combat, a political climate that's made regulation an expletive and a public that feels a generalized impotent uneasiness. I don't think we're on a slippery slope to a police state, Keller says, but I think we're all too complacent about our civil liberties. We could wake up one day and find that they're all gone. And that's the danger. I think, going back to the, to the last caller, I think maybe the way to deal with that danger is to begin to make the case loud and often why civil liberties and civil rights and privacy are so important to the operations of this republic. It's not just a matter of private rights. Just for a second, we only got a minute or two left in today's program. Think back to the Citizens United decision in, the, in 2010, the right of corporations to make unlimited contributions to political campaigns. The court's argument in support of that right of political contributions by corporations, the court's explanation was not the rights to free speech, to political free speech. The court's case was based on the importance that free speech plays to the operation of our political system in terms of the free exchange of ideas, the marketplace of ideas. The only way that the court felt that it could justify giving corporations the right to participate in our political campaigns with big money was to suggest that our political system requires free speech. And since corporations have a major contribution to play in our speech, it's very important that they be heard from. My point. The Supreme Court of the United States has given us in this decision an indication as to the ways in which we can raise the flags about the surrender of our privacy and our civil liberties. What perhaps we must do is make the same case to the public at large that the Supreme Court made in justifying corporate rights to make political contributions in Citizens United. The court has given us a strategy has told us how to do it. Now we've got to do it. And my feeling is that what the Head On Radio Network is about 
is making sure that these different points of view, these different ideas, all of them contingent on the availability and access to free speech. That's why it's important to keep this voice out there. The Virtual Center for the Study of the Constitution is intended to accomplish exactly that. Our goal is to educate the citizenry at large on the operative nature of our republic, what its intent was and what, it requ what its requirements are in order to work in the ways that it should work. And I think the answer that, to the question that our caller raised about how we began to, to make reforms, I think the Supreme Court of the United States and Citizens United gave us an answer to that question. We've reached the end of our day. It's 58 minutes after the hour. I'm Bill O'Brien, and I thank you so much for listening to today's program. I thank our callers, both of them, for their contributions to today's program. We'll get back together again next Monday. Please have a wonderful week and weekend. By all means, stay safe. We need every one of us, don't we? I'm Bill O'Brien. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great weekend.